Good to be here this evening. Uh, this evening we're going to share part three on how I escaped the Jehovah's Witnesses. I like that title more and more as I uh, think about it. But uh, I want you this evening to go to Matthew chapter 16 again. And when we began this uh, series on the uh, false doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses, and we started a series called Beware of the Doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, this is something that I once was a part of and escaped. And um, any false doctrine that you escape out of is a good thing. Amen? False doctrine is bad for us. And uh, false doctrine will lead you to hell. It will lead a soul to hell. It will lead a family and a church to hell. And I want us to look at Matthew 16 tonight. We began with this passage. I just kind of want to go back to it so we don't get too far away from it. But in Matthew 16, verse number 6... Jesus was speaking unto the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he says in verse number 6, he says there, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And then he goes on to explain to us in verse number 12 what he means by the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He says in verse 12, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And Jesus was saying, you need to beware of the doctrine and the teachings and the practices and the beliefs of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And today, we have Pharisees and Sadducees. We have false teachers, false prophets. And we need to beware of their doctrine because their doctrine is not in alignment with the Word of God. And so, the last time we, uh, last two sermons, we, we kind of outlined their history and where I came from. And, and then last time we got in more detail of some of their doctrines. And tonight we're going to continue that study of their doctrines and how it's not in agreement with the Word of God. And therefore, we ought to be aware of that doctrine as uh, poisonous bread. As Jesus said, beware of the leaven. And so last time we really emphasized how uh, Jesus Christ is equal to God the Father and how He is God in the flesh. For the Bible tells us that. And uh, last time we shared some scriptures on uh, uh, exactly where the Bible teaches that Jesus is God and then I gave you some verses that Jehovah's Witnesses use to say that Jesus isn't God like John 14, 28 and um, some other references. But last time I shared with us Isaiah chapter number 9 and I forgot the false perversion Bible home last time. So I happened to bring it with me th today. But um, sure enough, last time I was correct on how they changed Isaiah 9 verse number 6. Isaiah 9 verse number 6 in the authorized version calls Jesus the mighty God. And yet in the New World so uh, accustomed to doing and, and, and so well at doing is removing words out of the Bible in order to change doctrines to be more aligned with their tradition. And in Isaiah 9 verse number 6, the, I'll give you the true reading. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Three times the. Huh. That's kind of <laughs> makes sense. Amen. But uh, listen to the perversion. For there has been a child born to us, there has been a son given to us, and the princely rule will come to be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. One statement versus Wonderful, comma, Counselor. It's just Wonderful Counselor. And then it says, Mighty God. It left off, The Mighty God. <laughs> it just says, Mighty God. And then it says, Eternal Father. Versus the eternal father. And then it says prince of peace instead of the prince of peace. They took the word the away three times. Why? Because the is pretty singular, isn't it? You are the man. You're the man. <laughs> Amen. It's singular. It, it, it implies that. Well, 
Here we find they remove that because they don't want us to believe that Jesus is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. They just want us to think that He's a Prince of Peace. He's a mighty Father. And this is, this is false doctrine. This is, this, is the Pharise, this is the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we need to be aware of. And so that's just one example. Uh, last time we, we read through Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 5 through 8, and I told you that uh, this Bible, this perversion here, has uh, the word seizure in it. If you're in Philippians chapter number 2, let's go there and we'll read the, the true word of God tonight. Philippians chapter number 2, and then we're going to move on here. We won't spend much more time on the Godhead tonight and how they pervert that doctrine. But in Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 6, the true word of God says, Who, meaning Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal unto God. Why? Because he was in the form of God. He was God. So he, he didn't consider it robbery. He didn't think it to be robbery to be equal with God. Why? Because he was equal with God. But now listen to the perversion. It says here, Who, although he was existing in God's form, gave no consideration to a seizure, namely that he should be equal to God. In other words, the, this King James Bible says that Jesus was in the form of God and hence, because of that, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God because he was in the very form and nature of God, he was God. But the, this New World Translation says, yeah, he, although he was existing in God's form, he gave no consideration that he should be equal to God. That is totally different. Did he give consideration to be equal with God or did he not give consideration to be equal with God? Which is it? And yet, if you have two Bibles that, you know, this is light and this is darkness. And they don't agree. This is God. This is of the devil. They don't agree. And how can two walk together except they be agreed? Amen. There's no agreement here. Amen? And so tonight I'm going to show you other areas where there's no agreement with these two books. One being the Word of God and the other one being a perversion and a, an adulteration of the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, and God, I pray tonight that you just be with me as I continue preaching this message, Lord. Thank you for my uh, past. Thank you for the heritage that you've given me. Thank you for the testimony that's solid in my heart tonight of the Word of God. I pray, Lord, that you just help me preach you with power. And thank you so much for the absolute victory that you've given me in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So last time we left off with this seventh point, And that was that Christ was raised from the dead as an immortal spirit. And that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible actually teaches that Jesus' flesh rose from the grave. And we shared last time how Jesus said in John 2, uh, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And they thought that he was speaking about the temple that was, it took 46 years to build. And Jesus said, no, no, I'm talking about the body of this temple. And so Jesus, this body of the temple that Jesus was talking about, actually rose three days later and came back to life so that you and I can have victory and so that our resurrection is now guaranteed because of his resurrection. And so, um, I want you to go with, uh, let's see here, uh, go to uh, Matthew chapter 28, and I'll share with you another verse that proves that Jesus' body was actually resurrected, not uh, an immortal spirit. In Matthew chapter 28, I want us to look here at verse number 9, and this verse is actually also uh, corrupted in the New World Translation. In Matthew chapter 28, verse number 9, the Bible says, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. And then it says, saying, all hail. And they came and held him, Jesus, by the what? By the feet. Jesus' body was literal here. And notice what it says that they did when they came at Jesus' feet. They worshipped him. Now who does worship only belong to? God. Therefore, since quote unquote Jesus is not God, it says, and look, Jesus met them and said, good day. They approached and caught him by his feet and did obeisance to him. That is not the same as worship him, amen. This is a perversion. 
And what, they're, what, and, and what better thing would the devil have than for us not to worship Jesus? Amen? And so once again, this has been changed. Yea, hath God said. But, um, so we know that Jesus was raised, his, his actual physical body was, and you and I, one day our physical body is going to be raised as well. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This issue of whether or not Jesus uh, was resurrected is so important. Everything else hangs on it, according to the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 3, Paul here says in verse number 3, he says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he goes on to say some details about his resurrection. Now look at verse number, uh, oh let's see here, let's look at verse number 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, which by the way that's what we preach here, is that Jesus rose from the dead, amen. They, they put nails in his hands and put nails in his feet and he died on that cross and he was buried and yet he came back alive three days and they were able to put their fingers in the, in the prints of the nails in his hand and it was the same Savior that died on that cross three days prior. That's what I believe. He actually rose. His body rose from the grave. And there was an empty tomb that morning, amen. That's what I believe. And you know, so, so you got to wonder, wait a minute, if Jesus' body was not raised, then how did they go to an empty tomb? And I know kind of where they go with it. Evidently something just came and got his body or an animal or whatever. But I'm telling you, that's a bunch of false nonsense, amen? I mean, his body was gone from that tomb that morning because his body rose from the dead. Amen. And I'm telling you, I'm passionate about the resurrection of Jesus. And anything now that says that his body was not raised is absolute heresy out of hell. So he goes on to say in verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our what in vain? Our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also in vain. Why? He goes on to say in verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. I'm here to tell you tonight that Jesus was raised for our justification. And if he did not rise from that tomb and he didn't come back to life three days in that body, we are yet in our sins and we are bound for a place called hell. And I'm going to hit on hell hot and heavy tonight. Because that's going to be the next doctrine I'm going to show you from the Bible that they teach wrong. And they deny the existence of a place called hell. And I did for a long time. And, and uh, I tell you, you guys pray for my mama. I was able to witness to her three hours the other night. It was an absolute. I mean, I had to get up early the next morning. But I mean, I kept, you know, every once in a while I look at the phone and I'm like, oh, Lord. <laughs> Man, I got more sleep being taken away. But that's fine, amen. That's what we need to do. We need to get to the point where we realize, you know what? Someone going and dying to hell is worth more than getting a few hours of sleep, amen. Yeah. Amen. I tell you what, I started hearing the wheels turning. That's good stuff when you start hearing someone, oh. I mean, the light just kind of starts going off. I mean, it's, it, was, it was powerful that night. And... Um, so I explained to her, and, and if, if, you know, she said, so that's how simple salvation is? I said, you betcha. <laughs> that's how simple it is. And uh, so I'm telling you, just pray for her, because it's, it's heading in the right direction. You just sometimes know when someone's getting close. Amen? But um, the, the Bible here in 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the resurrection. Now we're going to move on to this next key doctrine right after the resurrection. And this is, the, this is the eighth point in their false doctrine. Number eight. The wicked will be eternally destroyed, not punished. And what Jehovah's Witnesses teach is a twofold false doctrine. Number one, soul sleep. That's number one. It's, they're not the only ones to teach it. So a Seventh-day Adventist teaches this doctrine. Um, there's a lot of other side cults or groups that teach this doctrine. And it's absolutely not a true doctrine. And so there are a lot of areas in the Bible that will talk about how they were sleeping in death. 
But I'm going to show you tonight that we are composed of three parts tonight. And all scriptures that Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, whoever they might be, that will show you, that try to prove this doctrine of soul sleep, never once is in reference to the soul, but the body. And I'm going to show you that in the Bible. But um, there are eight doctrines that the wicked will be eternally destroyed. So that's the first thing, is soul sleep. The second thing is, is this false doctrine of annihilationism. That we are simply, the wicked will simply just be destroyed and it happens in a moment and they don't they don't have to go through a, an eternity of burning in a lake of fire they're just going to be destroyed by fire and then they're done for all eternity and it's settled from there but I'm telling you that's not what the scriptures teach and I'm going to show you spot after spot so tonight we're going to normally when I preach on the doctrine of hell it's towards you and being lost amen that's usually but tonight I want to preach on the doctrine of hell from a different angle just proving its simple existence. Amen? And so, um, they, they teach this, uh, that, you know, they teach that hell is simply the grave. It's just the grave. So that being said, every person that you've ever loved or known that died, went to hell. Simply speaking, they went to mankind's common grave, is what they call it. Matter of fact, they spent a whole appendix in the back of this perversion trying to prove this doctrine of hell. Uh, let's see here. I don't even know where it's, where it's at in here. There it is. Sheol, Hades, and of course they go back to all this Hebrew stuff and Greek stuff. The common grave of mankind graved them. And so that's what they try to prove here. And they, they go to Gehenna and try to prove that because of Gehenna there's no hell. But let me show you what the Bible says tonight on this doctrine of hell. Uh, first and foremost, I want you to go to... Oh, let's see here. Go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. One thing I want you to understand firmly in your heart tonight is that heaven and hell are both places that have been prepared by God. I want you to, I want you to key in on a word here in these two passages I'm going to show you. Because it floored me when I saw it. In John chapter 14, verse number 1, the Bible says there, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And I just want to turn here because every false perversion takes the word mansions out and puts rooms here. And let's see, what does the perversion say? In the house of my Father there are many abodes. <laughs> abodes? Man, I thought rooms were bad. <laughs> Abodes is really bad. Wow. I'm heading to a mansion tonight. Amen. That's where I'm going. And my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. <laughs> then he says, I go to prepare. I go to what? Prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He's coming again, by the way. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. By the way, this promise was given to more than just 144,000 here. Amen. But what I want you to see here is that heaven and the Father's house, Jesus has prepared for us. Now I want you to go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And I want us to look at verse number, oh, let's see here, verse number 41. Matthew 25, verse number 41. The Bible says there concerning the wicked, it says in Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Now, annihilationism, that does not sound like everlasting fire to me. If the fire goes out and you're destroyed. That's not everlasting fire. Amen. Then it goes on to say, he says, he cursed in everlasting fire. And what's the word mentioned there? Prepared. God has prepared hell and he has prepared heaven. And you will go to either one or the other. And that's what the Bible teaches. Turn with me if you would. To, uh, let's see here. My notes are kind of all over here. Let's go to um, Luke 16. We all know Luke 16. Now, I'm going <laughs> to key in here on Luke 16. Because the Jehovah's Witnesses will say that Luke 16 is a parable. 
Therefore, what it's saying doesn't really have a whole lot of meaning, at least a literal meaning for us. And I remember reading their commentary, which I didn't bring it with me because it's, it's where it needs to be, not in my house, amen. But uh, I remember reading this chapter one time on their commentary in Luke 16. And I mean, it just floors you. The kind of concoctions and, 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 and twisting of this parable that they give here in Luke 16. But I'm going to tell you something. One thing that you need to remember about parables in the Bible. Jesus always explained them. There is no explanation after this parable. Quote unquote parable. <laughs> Why? Because it's simply not a parable. It's an absolute true story that Jesus was telling you about. A true life account that Jesus was telling you about here in Luke 16. The Bible says in Luke 16 verse number 19. There was a certain rich man. Well it ain't very certain if there wasn't really a rich man. <laughs> I mean, why well, say there was a certain rich man, and yet this be a parable and a story, and there really wasn't a rich man? Sounds like Jesus is kind of playing with us here, if that's what, if, what the Jehovah's Witnesses are right. But see, anytime the Bible says there was a certain, for example, you go read Job 1, there was a man in the land of us. The Bible ain't playing with it. it, it, it there was a man, there was a man, there was a man. And nowhere in this passage does he explain this parable. Because here's the deal. If this is a parable and it doesn't really mean what it means, then Jesus would tell us what it really meant. Amen? We wouldn't be in the dark and say, well, I wonder what he meant by that. I guess I got the faithful and the sweet slave class in New York to clarify it for me. <laughs> now let's read this passage. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Okay, there's the rich man. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And his iron to be fed with the crumbs, which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died. Simple as that. He died. This is not some, you know, it didn't really happen. He died. And he was carried by the angels. The angels are going to either carry you to heaven, or they're going to carry you to hell, one or the other. It says, the angels carried into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. You notice he was buried. What was buried? The body. Did he cease to exist after the body was buried? Continue reading on. The Bible says, continuing on, he says there, And in hell, he lift up his eyes. In hell. He lift up his eyes, being unconscious. It's not what it says. Being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now I want you to look at verse 28. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this what? Could anything be more clear that hell is a place? He says, please go warn my five brethren, lest they come into this place. And yet hell's not a real place. So once again, we see here in Luke 16, as long as you believe the Bible and don't call it a parable, you actually get true doctrine. I'm telling you what, there's probably 50 or more points on the doctrine of hell that we can glean just from this passage alone. And if it's a parable and doesn't mean nothing, we lose all that beautiful truth. Amen. I mean, I'm not saying hell is a beautiful place. But I'm talking about the reality of it and knowing the, the true doctrine of hell is right here in this passage. He calls it a place in, in verse number 28. Um, if you would, go with me, if you would, to uh, Revelation. Revelation. Chapter number 20. We already read Matthew chapter 25, verse number 46. And in Matthew chapter 25, which I'll, I'll read that when you guys go to Revelation 20. And I'll go to Matthew chapter 25. And once again, like so many other doctrines, the Jehovah's Witness is going to change this in the Bible in order to fit their idea. In Matthew chapter 25, verse number 21, the Bible says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. 
And in Matthew 25, 46, the Bible says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And now there's some people that will say, well, hell is real, but it's not forever. Well, then that's the case, and neither is eternal life for the righteous, because it uses the same word. We can't, play, we can't play like that. And so, but what I want you to key in on in verse number 46 of Matthew 25, is he says, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. If I'm sleeping, I'm not going through punishment. I mean, when, I hit, when my head hits the pillow... And I don't know nothing. I ain't experiencing no punishment. But he says these shall go into everlasting punishment. And the perversion reads, And these will depart into everlasting cutting off. So I guess forever they just get cut off limb by limb, I guess. I don't know. But I'm just telling you... <laughs> I love Gloria sometimes on this. She just cracks me up. But anyways... Everlasting cutting off. I guess that's forever having stuff cut off. I don't know. But I'm telling you, it's everlasting punishment. Amen. That's what it teaches. And of course, they change that and, and make themselves really make us laugh. Amen. But now you're there in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I want us to look at verse number 10. We read in Matthew 25, 41, that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. I'm going to tell you something. You go read 2 Peter 3, 9. God wants nobody to go to hell. Nobody. It's not his will that any person goes to hell. So when people say, well, God, you know, he's an unloving God, send people to hell. No, no, no. There's only one person that sends you to hell, and that's you. Amen. You're the one that sends yourself to hell. God does not send yourself to hell. You're the one that does that. He's prepared both places. It's up to you which one you want. If you don't accept Jesus Christ and thereby reject heaven, then you must go live somewhere else besides heaven. You make the decision where you want to live. My parents used to tell me all the time, you make your bed, you lie in it. <laughs> I knew right away if I was going to move out, that was it. <laughs> I mean, they made that very clear, amen. But um, in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 10, the Bible says concerning the devil, it says in Revelation 20, verse number 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into. Now, I want you to understand something. There's, if there's any phrase I want you to understand or, or underline in your Bible tonight, it's this two-word phrase, cast into. I'm about to go in detail what the Bible uses that phrase. Cast into into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are they're still there a thousand years later and it says shall be tormented day and night forever and ever so what I did was about a week ago I took the word torment and tormented and looked at it all throughout the Bible and never once does it mean just a blissful sleep it means tormented Flat out. That's why the devils in the gospel said to Jesus, Has the time come for us to be tormented? They knew where they were going. They weren't looking forward to it. Why would they be so frightened if it was just over in a second? They were soul sleeper annihilated forever and that was it. They were not looking forward to being tormented day and night forever and ever. Which is what the Bible teaches. Study the word torment and torment. It never means, ah, you know, just simply non-existent. So once again, we find the devil shall be tormented forever and ever. Go with uh, me to, oh, let's see here, Hebrews chapter number 9. I've used this verse a lot, so if you just want to listen to it, Hebrews 9, verse 27. The Bible says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Once again, death is not the judgment, it's after death then we get the judgment. And that's totally different than death. So once again, they teach that the wicked will not be eternally destroyed. Now, you read there in Revelation 20.10, where it says that the devil was cast into the lake of fire. This phrase, cast into, actually occurs in the Bible 44 times. And it, in every occurrence, 
whenever they're cast into, whatever they're cast into, it is a literal place. Every time. Go with me if you would to uh, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We'll just look at one example of this. Matthew chapter 4. And look with me at verse number 12. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 12. Now you remember, you read there in Revelation 20, the devil was cast into. And I told you, underline that phrase, cast into. Here in Matthew chapter 4, in verse number 12, the Bible says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was what? Cast into where? Was that not a literal place? Absolutely. You know, the Bible already said that hell was a place. But just in case we can't get them to be convinced that Luke 16 is not a parable, we can use this right now. Every time this word cast into is used in the Bible, it is a literal place. Let me read for you Psalm 140. The, the phrase cast into, used in connection with hell, is 14 times in the Bible. And let me, let me quote to you Psalm 140, verse number 10. Psalm 140, verse number 10, the Bible says, Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire. They're literally cast into a fire. Amen? And, uh, oh, let's see, in the Gospels, you, you find this expression used over and over, cast into. We won't go to all of these for the sake of time. But if you want to copy or you want some verses on it or just better yet if you got a Bible search and you just type in cast into and you'll find this all at the Bible and it's always a literal place always never an exception to it so we know that this is a literal place I'll give you an example Exodus chapter 1 verse number 22 the Bible says and Pharaoh charged all his people saying every son that is born ye shall cast into the river the river was a literal place <laughs> Just like hell is a literal place and you can't get around it. So let's say we've established the fact now that hell is a literal place. Their second argument is going to be, well, hell is the grave. Okay. Since they say hell is the grave, I'm going to do this little test now and we're going to go throughout the Bible. And we're going to look at some occurrences where the word grave is in the Bible. And we're going to substitute the word hell, since that's what it is. And let's see what kind of foolishness that we come up with tonight. Amen? So let's go with, oh, let's see here. Where's my first spot? Examples of using hell for the grave. Go to uh, Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. We're all the way over in Genesis. You knew one way or another we were going to get from the beginning of the Bible to the end. Amen? In Genesis chapter 50, I want us to look at verse number 5. Genesis 50. And let's look at verse number 5. Genesis 50, verse number 5. The Bible says, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my hell, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. That sounds foolishness, doesn't it? <laughs> it says, In my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. Once again, what they're saying is, is hell is the grave, and grave is hell. So if that's the case, then let's just substitute it every time and see what we get out of it. And it never makes sense, really. So let's look at 2 Kings chapter 13. Look at verse number 21. 2 Kings 13 verse 21. The Bible says, And it came to pass as they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Now, sepulcher is great. So let's read it now. And they cast the man into the hell of Elisha. That don't make sense, does it? <laughs> the hell of Elisha? Once again, if we substitute what they're saying, we, it doesn't take a lot to realize that doesn't make sense. So now let's go, let's substitute the word grave for hell. Go with me to, um, oh, let's see here. Go to Isaiah chapter 66. If you're not going, I'll turn there and read it for you. Isaiah chapter 66. The Bible there says... In Isaiah 66, verse number 22, 
It says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed uh, against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So we use grave for hell. We see here, it, it, it doesn't make sense. For example, if we were to read that, it would say that um, the worm shall not die in the grave. <laughs> I mean, it, just, it all just doesn't make sense. But of course, the worm does not die in a place called hell. The Bible talks about it. It does not die there. And so once again, there's plenty of situations. Uh, if you were to go to Luke 16, for example, prime example, we were there. And every time you find the word hell, you just substitute grave. You'd get a lot of foolishness. And in the grave, he lift up his eyes being in torments. <laughs> that don't make sense. And in the grave, he lift up his eyes being in torments. So once again, we see that if we, if we substitute this, it does not make sense. So let me give you a few fallacies of this doctrine, or this, uh, of the doctrine of hell. The first fallacy of hell is that hell is the grave. Not true. The second fallacy of hell is that fire in hell is figurative. Doesn't really mean that, it's just figurative. Well, let me tell you this much. The Bible uses the word fire 549 times. And with the exception of maybe three incidences, it's always a literal fire. Always. Go just, now you just go stay the word fire. And just see how much foolishness bringing this kind of doctrine. I'll give you, and for some reason I'm on this kick about, you know, if you look at a word, and if someone tells you it's what it means. For, I'll give you a prime example. I believe the Bible rule that a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years a day. But I'm also going to tell you this much right now. I've seen a lot of church people run with that principle and have abused scripture. If we have it that, then Jesus is still in the tomb. For how many days was he in the grave? I guess he's in the grave for 3,000 years. A day for a year, a year for a day. I've heard that all my... I'm about... To be honest, I've read enough prophecy. I'm about up to here on that thing. Because it doesn't make sense. I guess they're still marching around the city, the walls of Jericho, 7,000 years, because seven days is how much they did it. A day for a year. <laughs> I mean, you can see that if we're not careful, we, we just, we're not making sense of Scripture by an interpretation that we're forcing upon Scripture. And we should not do that. And that's why a lot of people take that principle, and that's how a lot of people say it took, uh, it took God 6,000 years to make the earth. Because a day for a year, a year... Once again, false doctrine coming out from that. How about we just, how about whenever the Lord tells you it's a day for a year, you just, it's a day for a year in that passage. How about that? Wouldn't that make more sense? <laughs> Instead of now taking it and running it throughout the whole Bible. God will tell you when it's a day for a year and a year for a day. Amen? Anyways, same thing with the parable and the doctrine of hell. The third thing, the third fallacy of the doctrine of hell is the wicked shall be annihilated. Once again, not true. And uh, if you go to Psalm 78, or I'll read it real quick here. Psalm 78, if you're taking notes, just write it down. Once again, if, if, if we substitute the word annihilation for every time we see the word destroy or destruction in the Bible or consume, we come across nonsense. Psalm 78, verse number 45. Listen to this. He sent divers sorts of flies... Among them. This is referring to God sending the ten plagues among Egypt. It says that he sent divers sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and he sent frogs, which destroyed them. So now, if destroyed or destruction always means annihilation, I guess the frogs annihilated the Egyptians. <laughs> That's, once again, we get foolishness when we, when we uh, teach false doctrine. But uh, let me move on to the next point. Point number nine, the human soul ceases to exist at death. This is not what the Bible teaches. And you'll see how this is hand in hand with each other. Because if the soul don't live on after death, it goes right in hand with their doctrine there's no hell. And so let me show you real quick um, what the Bible says about this. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Listen to what Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says. Once again, every verse that people will use to try to prove that your soul sleeps is actually talking about the body and not the soul. 
Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. For we're made out of dust, right? The dust shall return to the earth as it was. And the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Your spirit and body are different. Your body goes to the dirt. Your spirit goes to God. That's what the Bible reveals. Let me, uh, oh, let's see here. Let me uh, read, uh, go to James chapter uh, number 2. James chapter number 2. I like this verse. In James chapter number 2, verse number 26, the Bible once again is helping us understand that the body and the spirit are different. You are made up of a, practically a trinity. You are made up of body, soul, and spirit. And I think that's ironic because we, Jesus, or, or God the Father said in Genesis 1.26, Let us make man in our image. Doesn't seem weird that we're made up of body, soul, and spirit, a trinity, if we're made in the image of God. Amen? So once again, I, it all links itself. But in James 2, verse number 26, the Bible says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. When you look at a dead loved one, that's not really them in the fact that they went, they departed. And that's a very, you study the word departed. In 2 Timothy 4 said, Paul said, the time of my departure is at hand. Philippians 1.23, he said, look, I'm ready to depart and to be with Christ. Amen? Well, what's departing? For as the body without the spirit, Ecclesiastes 12.7, returns unto God. Y'all getting this? It's Lincoln perfect, isn't it? The language of scripture. So it's our body that's dead. So now when the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5, for the dead know not anything, it's talking about the body. That's their famous verse. Famous verse. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 and 6. Famous verse. That's a lot of them. Now, a lot of people that try to teach soul sleep, they'll always take you to Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 and 6. All you've got to understand is it's talking about the body and not the soul and the spirit. Pretty simple. Look with me if you would to Revelation chapter 6. We find this in Revelation chapter 6. If you turn there... Of course, this doesn't matter either if you believe that uh, the book of Revelation is symbolical and figurative and you can't really understand it. It doesn't really mean what it says. But in Revelation chapter 6, I want you to look at verse number... Oh, let's see here. Look at verse number 9. It says in Revelation 6, 9, When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the what? Souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testament which they held. Now were they, were they soul sleeping here? Let's look at the next verse. And they cried. That don't sound like you're sleeping if you're crying, you know. He says they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. That don't sound like these were souls that were sleeping. <laughs> they were crying. They were getting ready to put robes on. The doctrine of soul sleep, once again, is not in the Bible. You go read 2 Corinthians 12. Paul even said, hey, I knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body. Well, what was it? His soul and spirit had left the body. That's what the Bible teaches over and over and over. So, once again, we find that this doctrine of the human soul ceases to exist at death is simply not true doctrine. Uh, look with me if you would to Luke 23. Now this is where it's going to get real good. Luke chapter 23. Once again, Luke 23, we find the simplicity in salvation and the very fact that the thief on the cross right to Jesus, he could not come off that cross and join the Watchtower Society. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't go knock on doors. He couldn't do anything. Simply believe and call upon the name of the Lord is what he did. And Jesus said, you're, you're saved. Amen. Look, let, look, we're in Luke 23 here. And this is, gets really, really tricky. Luke 23 here, verse number 43. Jesus in verse number 42. Uh, it says in verse 42 that the thief on the cross said unto Jesus, Lord, there it is right there. Lord. Boom, right there, thou shalt confess with thy mouth. And he did it on the cross right beside Jesus. He said, Lord, 
He accepted Jesus as his Savior and Lord that day, dying on his deathbed, which is commonly what happens to a lot of people. Deathbed conversions. And yet this thief right to the, the side of Christ, he said, Lord, and right there he got saved by confessing him Lord. Man, that's beautiful. So he says there, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Now the next verse, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Did you know, and this is really common sense, but I'm just going to reiterate. Did you know the reason why a comma exists is so that there can be a pause? That's the reason why a comma exists. So what Jesus was saying here, he says, look, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, pause. Today thou shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now let me give you a perversion of it. They don't, <laughs> this gets really good, I tell you. Luke 23, 43. Actually, let's go and read verse 22. And he went on to say, Jesus. Mm. They leave out the word Lord there. Imagine that. <laughs> and when he went on to say, uh, Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom. Verse 43. And he said unto him, Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Right there in Luke 23, 43, where is the comma at? It's before the word today. It's before the word today. In the perversion, it's after the word today. Do you know that changes the meaning entirely? It entirely changes it. Because now, instead of what we got here, the Bible is saying, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now we've got this. And he said unto him, Truly I tell you today, pretty much that someday you'll be with me in paradise. How convenient to get around the doctrine that he was going to go immediately to heaven. There it is. Just, 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 just move the comma and you can get all kinds of false doctrines. Man. I wash my hands. Touch not the unclean thing. Amen. I tell you. Once again, this doctrine, the human soul ceasing to exist at death, is an absolute not true doctrine. Um, you go read 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. We'll close it up right now. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to read this verse for you because once again, we, some people say, well, show me in the Bible we're made up of body, soul, and spirit. Well, I'll show you right here. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 23. And this ain't the only spot. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 23. The Bible says there, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. You and I are composed of a whole being. And we ought to be sanctified wholly. Then it goes on to say how this whole is made up. And I pray God that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The whole being of you is made up of body, soul, and spirit. When you take your last breath, your body ceases to exist. It's dead. It's gone. It's sleeping. It's non-existent at that moment. But your soul and spirit will either go to a place called hell or heaven until the final judgment. Until the resurrection. And then when the resurrection takes place, your body's coming up out of that grave. And it's going to meet your soul and spirit for the final judgment. And after that, you're either going to be thrown into heaven or you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity. Not hell. Lake of fire. Because hell is thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation 20. And so you, that's why, I mean, I know it's kind of subtle. It's not a real big deal. But in all honesty, even I say it sometimes, hell is forever. The lake of fire is forever. Hell is like a local jailhouse until the final court case. And then you're thrown into prison for good. And that's what the lake of fire is. It is for sure prison. And it is sealed from that moment on. And that's what the lake of fire is. And it is a true lake of fire. What it is. Next week we'll go into more. I, I didn't really get to everything I wanted to get to. I want to show you. And next time I will. I'll actually show to you the location of hell. 
The Bible gives us the location of heaven, and it's in the north parts. But the Bible reveals to us the location of hell, too. And I'll just simply tell you, it's in the heart of the earth. And Jesus' body, now you listen to me very clearly here. Jesus' body did not go to the heart of the earth. Did not. And I'll show you that next time.